بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هون جزاكم الله خير After this next session inshallah we'll conclude the final part of the fiqh section will be the third part the fiqh the third part of fiqh and after that we'll have a question and answer session inshallah so we're going to pass out the index cards inshallah if you have any questions you can write it or we have some pens here we'll pass out the index cards if you have any questions we'll try to answer it to the best of our ability if you don't know the answer then wallahu alam we'll try to find the answer from someone else inshallah later on but we answer those questions that we know, we do know the answers to to the best of our ability inshallah we'll try to answer all of your questions another thing is this card was made about you could say a week ago uh, in toronto was passed out to a lot of people and a lot of massages they use this so one way to keep yourself active and productive in the month of ramadan is to make a schedule or a chart for yourself have some goals that you want to do in ramadan and so one of my teachers tells me that every ramadan i add a new habit to my life so maybe the first ramadan long time ago when i started this practice i might have added tahajjud to my schedule and alhamdulillah after ramadan i continued the schedule after ramadan too so every ramadan i would add a new habit so something that we can do is make a chart mark down what we did or didn't do or some things that we want to do in the month of ramadan that from inshallah make a new practice in the month of ramadan allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it that the environment the atmosphere is such that it's very easy for you to do ibadah in this month very easy to read quran the way you can read quran in the month of ramadan you can read it outside of the month of ramadan so you can make some kind of chart like this we made this chart it's a pre-made chart you could say basically if you look at some of it if these are some things that you want to consider then use this chart inshallah and be a benefit for you and others and if you want, we should have some extras. If you don't, you can ask me, I'll make you some extras. And those family members that won't are able to attend or some friends, you can give it to them too. And you never know, for every check mark they put, for every mark they put, you'll get the reward for it too. And especially in the month of Ramadan, when we're trying to get as much as reward as we can. So if you didn't get this card, you can come to me. You can, um, later on, we'll try to get you one of these cards if you didn't get it yet. But this will be very beneficial, inshallah. Without further ado, I'd like to call up my other classmate, inshallah, Malana Ahmed Jafri, to conclude. The thick portion of this, and we'll pass out the index cards, inshallah, to write any questions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah, inna alhamdulillah, inna ahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru wa numinu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamadilla lah, wa man yadilhu falahadiya lah. Wa nashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa nashadu anna sayyidana wa maulana muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh amma ba'd. Inshallah, going on with the next section in this book and just if you guys might be wondering that why is the same person coming up twice it's not the same person it was actually my twin brother the other time and now I am coming up going on to the next section things that are re reprehensible for the fasting person we went over this as to what does reprehensible mean in the Arabic term it is termed as anyone remember we just went over it in the beginning. It is termed as makru, something that is dislike, and you may be rep held re responsible for going and doing these actions. These actions are such that they won't necessarily break your fast, but there's a very great and big chance that it might break your fast in regards to the things that you do, and we'll go over some of them here. Going on to the first one, to taste any article of food or drink and spit it out. It won't break your fast, but nevertheless, there's a very big chance that if you taste something, or if you put it in your mouth, that it may just go down your throat and into your stomach, which will cause your fast to be nullified. Let's look at the hadith narrated by Hadith Ibn Abbas anhumah. He says, لَا بَأْسَ أَنْ يَذُوقَ الْخَلَّ وَالشَّيْءَ مَا لَمْ يَدْخُلْ حَلَقَهُ That there is no sin in tasting vinegar or anything else as long as it does not enter his throat. Now if a person tasting something, he puts some vinegar or whatever it may be, whatever it possibly can be, he tastes something, he puts it in his mouth. There's a very big possibility, and you and I know it, there's a very big possibility that some of the flavor might stay in our mouth 
which will, and we might end up swallowing it, which will cause our fast to be nullified. So by, by merely putting something in our mouth, or by merely tasting something, our fast will not break. But nevertheless, ulama and the jurisprudence, they have said it is disliked and it's re reprehensible. Why? Because there is a very big possibility that if a person tastes something, or he puts something in his mouth, that it may go down to his throat or down to his stomach, through which his fast will be nullified and his fast will be broken. The next one, to gargle or clean the nose excessively. As we know, when we are doing wudu, when we are performing ablution, well, how do we do wudu? We're supposed to put nose in our mouth three times and make sure it goes all the way to the top. Of course, not going to our brains, but going to the top as most as we can, making sure we clean our nose properly and gargling, rinsing our mouth properly, making sure that everything, any dirt that's in our mouth, it comes out while we are performing wudu. But when the month of Ramadan comes, as I said, what do we have to do here? There's a big possibility in any of these things that is going to come that we are going to read. There's a very big possibility and very big chance that some water might go down our throat when we are rinsing or gargling our uh, our mouth. In the month of Ramadan, we are told not to do this. Don't do. Don't gargle your mouth so much that or your throat that. The water may go down your throat. Instead, just rinse your mouth in the month of Ramadan. So you stay away from that possibility that water might go down your throat or might go down to your stomach. Let's look at the hadith. It's on page 27, the second hadith. Narrated by Asim ibn Laqit ibn Sabra radiallahu ta'ala from his father. He says that, I said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me about wudu. Tell me, explain to me some things about wudu. To the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Asbigh al wudu'a, complete the wudu. Okay? Wa khalil bayn al asabir, and make sure you cross the fingers between one another, which is called as khilal, as we may know of it. Wa balig fil istin shaqi, illa an takuna sa'iman. He says, and thoroughly clean out the nose unless you are fasting. Unless you are in the state of fasting, unless you are in the month of Ramadan, when you are fasting, what are you supposed to do? Stay away from gargling your mouth. Once again, by gargling or rinsing your mouth, it won't break your fast. But there is a very big possibility, there's a very big chance that when a person is gargling his mouth, water may go down to his throat, through which it will cause a person fast to be nullified. Now we have to understand a rule here. That the ulama rahimahumullah ta'ala, they have written, the scholars, the jurisprudence, they have written. And we have to understand as well, anything that goes into the stomach or that goes into the brain will nullify the fast. Anything that goes into the stomach or that goes into the brain, it will nullify the fast. The question comes, a person is walking through an area which is dusty, has a lot of dust. A person smells this or breathes this air. Will his fast be nullified or no? <coughs> According to the rule, will his fast be nullified or no? Looking at the rule, because anything that goes into the brain, it will nullify if when you smoke or when you inhale it, eventually it does reach there. Therefore, according to the rule, it should. But no, it will not break the fast. Why? Because we have to understand the rule. The rule is that in the author of Ma'arif al-Sunan, he writes that Dukhula Dukhani ad-Dimagha ghayru mufsid that just by this type of air entering into our system or into our brains will not nullify the fast. What is it? What is the condition they write? Idkhaluhu, idkhaluhu mufsid to deliberately enter it, to smoke it, to inhale it deliberately either by any means through that, it will nullify the fast, and through that, we see where it's a common thing to smoke hookah or to even smoke cigarettes will nullify the fast because of this reason. Why? Because we are deliberately inhaling it into our systems and into our bodies. If there was just smoke and we were walking by and we just inhaled it, that will not merely break the fast, but by us deliberately inhaling it into our system, by that, it will nullify our fast. Now, the second part of the rule, by something entering the stomach. By something entering the stomach, the fast will be nullified. What does this mean? A person, there are many ways 
a person sometimes through some injections, some might go into the stomach. The ulama rahimahumullah ta'ala, they have differed in regards to this. Some injections, when you, when you are injected, some go to the stomach, some don't. Some ulama say that it does break the fast. Some ulama say that it does not break the fast. The preferred opinion of the ulama rahimahumullah ta'ala, they say that when you are injected, whether it goes to the stomach or whether it's in the system, it goes, it's flowing through your bloodstream. Whatever the case may be, it will not break your fast. The condition for something going into the stomach and nullifying your fast is that it goes down through the normal ways, which is through your mouth, through your throat, and right down into your stomach. Through that procedure, if it goes through those stages into a person's stomach, only then will his fast be nullified. Either than that, in any other way, his fast will not be nullified. Nevertheless, these are things that are some uh, that are reprehensible. They are makrud, they are disliked. If a person can avoid these, then it is best that a person avoid these at all causes because once again, there is a slight chance that that injection or whatever it may be, it may go into the stomach which will cause the fast to be nullified. So through that general rule, we can't say it will nullify it, but because there is a possibility that it may go down into the stomach, and wallahu alam, what it may be, what it may cause, it may or may not nullify the fast. Through that, the ulama rahimahumullah ta'ala say that these are things that are reprehensible. If a person can avoid them through till after Ramadan or get it done before Ramadan, then it is better to do so. But if he definitely needs to do it in the month of Ramadan while fasting, then it is also permissible. Inshallah, going on to the next hadith. The last hadith on this page, page 21 if I'm correct, or 27. It is disliked to kiss if a person does not feel safe. Mufti Asif, mashallah, already covered it, but we'll go over it just a little more. Looking at the hadith narrated by Hadith Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala an, master of hadith, he says that a person came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding fondling with one spouse in regards to a fasting person. So the Messenger وسلم, permitted him to do so. Then another man came and asked the same question. He prohibited him from doing so. So one person came and asked, he gave him permission. Another person came and asked for the same question and the Prophet وسلم, said, no, you're not allowed to do so. So the first one was a yes, the second one was a no. So Abu Hurairah he says that the man he permitted, the man he gave permission to go ahead and kiss or whatever, he was an elderly person. And the person the Prophet ﷺ prohibited was a young person. As Mufti Asif said, that it's better a person does not get married before the month of Ramadan because in the month of Ramadan, it might become dangerous for him. The marriage might actually become dangerous for him. And this is a reason because when a person is a newlywed, his temptations are a lot higher than it would be when a person is at an elderly age, at an older age. Therefore, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayh, they say that it is totally fine for a person. It is totally fine for a person to either touch or kiss his wife. For that person, for that person who can say with certainty that it will not lead to marital or sexual intercourse. For that person, it will be totally fine to kiss or touch his wife. But for a person who does not have this certainty, for a person who cannot be this certain, excuse me, a person who cannot say this with certainty, for him it will not be a good idea and it, might, it will be makru and it might even lead him to having sexual intercourse which will cause him to do kafara and inshallah that will come up in the next section. Now of course some scholars, they say also say such as Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi, they say that whether a person has this certainty of not leading it, of not going to sexual intercourse by kissing or touching, scholars like Imam Malik and others, they all say that generally regardless if that person can say with certainty or not, it is makru, it is something that should be avoided at all causes. Once again, it's something that a person may do, he may be able to do with certainty, but nevertheless, shaitan whispers. 
the whispers of shaitan, it's inside of us. Even if it may be in the month of Ramadan, our nafs is still there. And there's a very big chance that we might not be able to control ourselves. The Prophet ﷺ had full control. We don't even have half the control the Prophet ﷺ had. So it's better a person stays away from these things and focuses on worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month of Ramadan. Inshallah, going on to the next section, section or page 28. Actually, it's the same section, just one last hadith. In regards to backbiting, arguing, to quarrel, use filthy or indecent words, lie or swear. In regards to this, Hadith Abu radiallahu ta'ala narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna siyama laysa min al-akli wa shurbi that indeed fasting is not only from abstaining from eating and drinking, but also from vain speech, foul language, and foul language. If one of you is being cursed at or annoyed, he should say, I am fasting. Now backbiting, of course, in all these actions, there are such acts that at all times, they were always hated, and these are all actions that a person shouldn't do. And there are such actions that some scholars, a, mi a minority of them, they have actually said that the fast will break. But majority and the preferred opinion is that a person's fast will not break. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the reward that this person was supposed to get for that day, for fasting on that day, he will be deprived of this, fa of this reward. Why? Because in the time of fasting, a person should have full consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he is obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even at this time, if a person can do such deeds, that he, then he is not worthy in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get the reward for fasting that day. And some scholars say that a person should actually even make up that fast on a different day after the month of Ramadan. Why? To show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of his repentance and sincerity of his action. Inshallah, going on to the next section, things that break the fast. Now, the last section that we just covered were things that, things that are reprehensible. Things that are, they may or may not break the fast, and it's preferred that you stay away from those actions. But these actions are such that they will break the fast if a person does any of these actions. The general principle we need to understand is, narrated by Ibn Abbas and Akram, Akram radiallahu ta'ala an, they say that, As-sawmu mimma dakhala, that fasting will break due to what enters the body and not due to what exits the body. Meaning if a person starts bleeding, his fast will not break. A person vomits involuntarily, his fast will not break. And I'm saying involuntarily because of the commentary that we'll go ahead, we'll go over it in the next hadith insha'Allah. So the general rule is, a person's fast will not break by that which comes out of the body, but his fast will break by that which enters the body, and we've covered quite a bit of it already. So, let's go on to the first one. If one deliberately made himself vomit a mouthful. If one deliberately made himself vomit a mouthful. Those are two conditions. Number one, deliberately he actually made himself intentionally, and number two is making himself vomit a mouthful. There are only two cases, only two cases in which vomiting will actually break your fast. Only two cases. Other than that, any other case you can possibly bring up, it will not break your fast. Only two that will actually break your fast. Number one, a person who vomits a mouthful. A person who vomits a mouthful and swallows it. A person who vomits a mouthful and swallows it, his fast will obviously break. Number two, a person who makes himself vomit a mouthful, which is in this hadith. So a person who makes himself vomit a mouthful, then his fast will, will break, and of course he will have to do kafara. And what is kafara? What's expiation? We'll go over that in the next part, inshaAllah. And of course, going on with the hadith, مَنْ ذَرَعَهُ الْقَيْءِ وَهُوَ الصَّائِمٌ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ الْقَضَاءِ وَمَنْ اسْتَنْقَى فَلْيَقْضِي that Whoever has involuntarily vomited while fasting does not need to make up the fast. But if someone deliberately vomits, then he needs to make up that fast. In the next hadith, same thing. An Nabi Huraita radiallahu ta'ala an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal that whoever has involuntarily vomited while fasting does not need to make up the fast. If someone deliver, deliberately vomits, then he needs to make up the fast. Now next, something else that will break a person's fast. 
or excuse me, I said there will be kafara. There will not be kafara. It will be qada actually. And we'll go on to what qada and kafara. There's a difference. Qada is actually just making up that one date. Kafara is actually having to fast for two months consecutive. And if a person isn't able to do that, then he has to do other things that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has mentioned. And we will go over that as well. So if, next thing is, if a person mistakes the time for suhoor or sunset, meaning and eats after suhoor time ends or before iftar time starts, then he must make up the fast. However, there is no expiation, meaning kafara do on him. Meaning, let's just give an example. Fajr time comes in right now. Nowadays, it comes around 4.30. Say a person is eating all the way till 4.40. If a person thinks suhoor time ends at 4.40 and he's eating all the way up till there, then on this person, unintentionally, he did not know. He thought the time of suhoor ended at the time of 4.40 and he was eating up till that day. He will not have to do kafara, but he will have to make up that day, the fast of that day. Same thing at the time of iftar. Say the mu'adhan accidentally gives the adhan two minutes earlier before the time. Regardless if it's two minutes, one minute, or 30 seconds, if the mu'adhan gave the adhan before the time and the people started eating, then they will have to make up that day, but they will only have to make up that one day. They will not have to do kafara, and kafara is obviously a lot more. Qada is just fasting that one day again and after the month of Ramadan. And in this, there's a story of one Sahabi that was mentioned in the beginning in, in regards to the Quran. That a Sahabi, he took the literal meaning of the Quran ayah that said that keep eating until the white thread distinguish, it distinguished itself from the uh, white thread. The black thread did it from it from the white thread. And of course, the ulama, rahimahullah, they have written a lot on this. And the meaning was when the light of the day, when the light of the day came in, at that point, stop eating, and that that is what it was referring to. And of course, the uh, hadith was mentioned before. The point of it is, the point of this part is just to let us know that if a person accidentally confuses himself and thinks of the time of suhoor to be later than it actually is, and he still is eating until that time, meaning the time of suhoor ends at 4.30 and he eats till 4.40. Then at that point, a person only has to do qada and no kafara will be upon him. Same thing with the time of iftar. If a person breaks his fast earlier than he was, he was supposed to, then only he, will, he will only have to do qada and he will not have to do kafara. Now the next or anything put by force into the mouth of a fasting person. If someone holds a gun to your head and says, you better eat or else I'm going to kill you, then go ahead and eat. Don't, don't, break your, don't give up your life for just one fast. Of course, the fast is great in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but your life is more important. If a person, if you just ever happen to come in this scenario where you have to eat, you absolutely have to eat, the person is forcing you to eat. No matter what you do, you have to eat now, then go ahead and eat, it's okay. Of course, after that, you have to do qada. Of course, this is when you are being forced. Not just, my, my, my stomach is forcing me. No, that does not count. It doesn't matter what your stomach is saying. If, if it's a life or death situation, then go ahead and eat. You won't have to do kafara, but nevertheless, you will have to do qada. You will have to make that day up. Let's go over the hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, my ummah is not held responsible or accountable for actions that are done out of mistake or forgetfulness and that are committed through force. Meaning a person forces you to eat in the month of Ramadan, then go ahead and eat. But of course, after that, make it up for, make that one day up. The next one, to eat and drink, forgetting that one is fasting and thereafter thinking that the fast is broken, so to eat again and drink. Mufti Asif went through this a little. A person, he is walking wherever he may be at his workplace. He has a habit that whenever he's walking by the water fountain, he goes and takes a drink. Of, a, a drink. Usually, you know, people like you and I, whenever we go by the fridge, we have this temptation. The fridge is calling us and we need to get something from the fridge. Even though we may not be hungry, we just need to make sure we get something from the fridge. So just like that, so I think the power is dead. Inna Allahi wa nailahi raji'un. But I think I think it's it's his time. So I know what I was saying. Okay, so if a person forgetfully he goes and breaks his, he goes and eats something or drinks something out of forgetfulness. 
if a person does this, then after that he's like, you know what, I already ate. Might as well just keep eating. Might as well keep eating. After he remembers that he is fasting, then this person now, he has to make up his fast qada. But this is because he only has to do qada and not kafara. Because now he ate thinking, first time it was forgetfulness. But after that he's like, you know what, I ate already, my fast is already broken. So might as well just keep eating. So this person keeps eating, and due to that, he didn't keep his fast. So for that day he has to do qada. Over here, in the beginning, if he intentionally ate, then he would have to do kafara. But the first time he ate was out of forgetfulness. He forgot he was fasting, then he started eating. After he started eating, then he remembered he was fasting, and he's like, I already started eating, I can't leave my food. So he started finishing, he finished his food. At that point, a person out of forgetfulness the first time, then thinking that he broke his fast and keeps eating, he will only have to do qada, and he won't have to do kafara. Inshallah, we'll just wait. Jazakallah. It's back to life. And just going over the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu. So the, the question is clear that if a person eats out of forgetfulness, then he thinks that his fast is broken, so he keeps eating, he will only have to do qada. Okay, this is after he ate the first time and he thought his fast was broken. He thought his fast was broken. So Hadith Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that whoever forgetfully eats or drinks while he is fasting, he should complete his fast. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who fed him. A lot of times we see someone, we might be with some Muslims, and we see someone eating in the month of Ramadan. And the thought might come to us that I wish I was in his position eating out of forgetfulness. A lot of times it may come that I wish I was in his position, Allah gave me that gift of eating. But of course this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgetfulness is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gave us the ability and Allah gave us the chance to eat at that time, but that is only for a person who forgetfully eats or drinks. Now going on to this word kafara that you've been hearing, kafara and qada, what is this kafara that we are, ta we are talking about? Kafara is expiation, expiation is due on someone for one of the three things. And he does these three things intentionally. Number one, someone who deliberately eats. Okay, someone who deliberately eats intentionally, knowingly, with all conscience. He knew he, what he was doing and he ate. Or he drank, or has sexual intercourse in its complete form. Meaning that it was actual sexual intercourse and it was, just, it was not just ejaculation, it was actually sexual intercourse from both parties, therefore, a kafara will be upon this person, he will have to do kafara. Looking at the hadith, Hadith Amr ibn Sa'ad radiallahu ta'ala reports that his father said, A man came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, I deliberately, meaning I intentionally broke a fast in the month of Ramadan. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him three options. Number one, free a slave, which is not practical in our time. Number two, which the last two apply to us, Fast for two consecutive months, not 20, 30 days and then sometime in our, uh, at some other time in our life we fast another 30 days. No, two consecutive months back to back, a person has to fast. And last but not least, if a person cannot do that due to any illness or whatever, feed 60 needy people. And the commentary of this, it will be, in, it's on the bottom. Method of offering kafara. Now the first one they didn't even mention as to being a slave because it's not practical in our time. We don't know of any slaves, or at least I don't know any. Method of offering kafara, number one, fasting two consecutive months, which is 60 days. If one is physically unable to fast for 60 consecutive days, then he may feed the poor in any of the following manners. Number one, feed 60 needy individuals to their full for two meals. Okay, you are doing it to 60 different people and you are giving them two different meals. Or the second option is, Feed one needy individual two meals for 60 days, which is pretty much the same thing. Or number three, give 60 needy individuals or give one poor person for 60 days three and a half pounds of wheat, which is approximately 1.6 kilogram, or its value in cash or food grains. So these are the two options really. And the second one has three different ways you can give it. Kafara, of course, if one deliberately eats, drinks or has sexual intercourse in its complete form and I mentioned what the complete form is and what, I, what, what does a person have to do if he does one of these things? He has to feed fast firstly 
for two consecutive months. If a person, for some reason, is unable to do this, then a person has the option of feeding the needy and the and the whatever it is. It's on here. If anyone needs to refer to it, they can they can always go to that. Next, fidya is redemption, which is if a person from the beginning, say the month of Ramadan comes, and a person is unable to fast. He doesn't break his fast. He just can't fast. Whatever illness, whatever it may be, he is traveling or whatever due to illness, and he can't ever ever fast after that. Remember to give fidya. If a person needs to give fidya, the condition is that he cannot fast right now and there is no hope of this person ever being able to fast ever again. Let's look at it and we'll understand better. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ I don't know how long ago I got this 10 minutes card, but inshallah I'll try to wrap it up. وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ For those familiar with the Arabic language, they know that there, even though there is no negating letter in this, no negating particle in this ayah, they know that the word yutiquna, the fi'il, the, it has it encompassed in it, the negating meaning. Those who do not have the strength to fast must give a monetary compensation, which is meaning feeding one needy person per fast. Ibn Abbas, he is just mentioning that this verse has not been abrogated maybe at that time, but it is now. It refer the meaning of it is still there, but it is not in the Qur'an. It refers to an elderly man, an elderly woman who cannot fast. They will feed one needy person in lieu of each fast, and this is narrated in Bukhari. Now they're just mentioning some things as to what a person needs to do. A very old person who does not have the strength to fast, and who is too fast, or a very, very sickly or diseased person who has no hope of recovering. That is the condition. Who never, who has no hope of recovering after the month of Ramadan or ever in his life, for him, he can go ahead and give fidya for each of the fasts he missed. And what is fidya? How much is fidya? Inshallah, in the next section, Mufti Samir will cover. So if a person has this condition, remember, never in his life in the future, he has absolutely no hope of ever recovering or gaining strength, then for this person, he can give fidya. Nevertheless, look at the next part. If, however, the old or sick person gains strength or recovers after Ramadan, he must keep the missed number of fasts and wh whatever was given as fidya. Maybe he didn't fast for two years, 60 days. Now he gave 60 needy people to eat. After that, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him shifa and he gets his ability and strength to fast. Now what happens to the 60 feedy people, the 60 fidyas that he already gave? What happens to that? Inshallah we are going to hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards him for that. But now because he has the capability of fasting again, he must fast for all those. He must do qada for all those fasts that he missed. Now a question might come, say someone's parents or someone's relatives or anyone passed away and they had some fast obligatory upon them that they did not fulfill. Can I fast on behalf of that person? The answer is no. A person cannot fast on behalf of another person. Neither can a person pray on behalf of another person. Nevertheless, I could fast and give the reward of my fast to someone else. That is completely fine. I can pray and give the reward of my prayer to someone else, but I cannot fast as uh, his, I cannot fulfill his responsibility. Salah is further upon this person. For him, he doesn't want to wake up for Fajr one day. He says, yo, can you read for me? It doesn't work like that. You have to do your own responsibility. Nevertheless, the reward you can be given by the other person. Hadith Abdul, looking at the hadith on page, I don't know what page this is. Page 31. Hadith Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. He, was, he used to be asked that may one offer, may one fast or offer salah on behalf of another. He would say no one may fast on behalf of another or offer salah on behalf of another. And the note is just making up or just saying that it is permissible to fast and give the, give the whatever the reward was. You can give the reward to the other person, but of course the responsibility of the other person you cannot fulfill. Everyone is has their own responsibilities and you cannot res be responsible for them. Now, a person who passes away and he has some, he has some fast upon him, he has some fast obligatory upon him, it is very, it's very much advised that a person 
writes down whatever is respon whatever he is responsible for, meaning he wasn't able to fast five days last Ramadan. Then he should have that written down until he has completed it. Why? Because what? He, who knows when he may pass away? And if no one knows that he has five fasts to give fidya for, then no one will ever fulfill that responsibility for him. So it is very important that a person has it written down if by chance he has five fasts or whatever it may be. Whatever the will it may be, he gives the will, he puts it in his will that I have five days of fast that I have to make up. If I am not able to make up, then someone give the fidya for me and that is what it's saying in the next section. And that a person gives fidya on behalf of the person, whatever, whoever it may be, whether it be parents, relatives, friends, whatever, whoever it may be, Make sure we give it on their behalf and they, have to, they must write a will in regards to how much, they, how much fast they have missed or how much salawat even they have missed. And of course, the last hadith is just mentioning the proof for that. Whoever narrated by Hadith Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever passes away when he, has, when he has to fast for one month or even less, one needy person should be fed on his behalf for each day of fasting, which is just saying if a person passes away and he has some fast obligatory upon him that he has not fulfilled, that he is responsible for, or even some salah that he had not prayed, he missed, he has to do qada of, then he should write it in his will as to how much he needs, how much he needs to fast or how much he needed to pray so that someone can pay fidya on his behalf. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will leave him of his responsibility. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the ability to truly bring these into our actions and give us the ability to f truly take Ramadan, take the benefits of Ramadan, and use Ramadan as was described to us by our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Jazakumullahu khayr wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.